Say one thing for the Beatles, they never forgot their friends. Despite planet-wide fame and jillions in record sales, the Beatles maintained a tight group of friends and management throughout their entire career. The number of people who supported the band, despite the massive machine that hummed along for eight years, could really be counted on both hands. Neil Aspinall, Brian Epstein, Mal Evans, Frida Kelly, George Martin, these folks were there every step of the way. But there was another name that stepped in and out of the Beatles' lives at several points, especially after their breakup and into their solo career. He was a talented German artist who, aside from designing some of the most iconic album covers in the history of rock and roll, was also a pretty kick-ass bass player. And that makes him worthy of inclusion in this series. So, the surprising and winding road of Klaus Vormann, next on Forgotten Fretmasters. Hello, friends, and welcome once again to Forgotten Fretmasters, the documentary series where we examine guitarists or musicians who, for one reason or another, might not have been as commercially successful as, had the longevity of, or just left us sooner than some of the other guys who often end up on all the top 10 lists. Today, we're going to look at the first bass player in our series, and it's a name you may not know. Klaus Vormann is best known for his association with the Beatles, but he actually had a successful art and music career aside from them, and his life is an interesting mixture of commercial and graphic art and a surprising list of albums that Klaus lent his bass to, as you'll see later on in the video. But remember, if you like rock history content like this, be sure to subscribe to the Guitar Historian channel and hit the like button below if you think rock history fans would like to see this content. I would also like to take a moment to announce that a portion of my proceeds from YouTube in 2022 will be going to an amazing charity called Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. My son was just diagnosed with Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy and our fight is just beginning. But the work that Parent Project MD is doing runs the gamut between patient support and directly funding the research and development of exciting new drugs and treatments for this disease. If you'd like to learn more about Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, I've left a link in the description below. Your viewing and sharing of this and any of my other videos will help this amazing charity do their tireless work. And with that, let's get on with the video. Klaus Vormann was born on 29 April 1938 in Berlin, Germany. The son of a physician and a sibling to six other brothers, Klaus was raised in North Berlin and has talked about his dyslexia growing up, which naturally pushed Klaus into a more artistic track in school. Interestingly, despite growing up at a time of great upheaval in Germany with the war ending when Klaus was seven years old, not much is available of the Vormann family story in relation to World War II. Vorman's story seems to start post-war, and he was surrounded early by music and art, with both of his parents being interested in the arts and fostering Klaus's journey. But despite his obvious talent for music, his father felt it best that Klaus study commercial art, and he was enrolled at the, um, okay, I'm going to butcher this, the Meister School for Grafik und Buckerwerb. Sorry, German fans. Um, anyway, Klaus would eventually find himself in Hamburg, Germany, attending the... Meister School for Gestaltung. It would be in Hamburg that Vorman would strike up a friendship with two other art students, fashion student Jürgen Vollmer and photographer Astrid Kircher. Vollmer and Kircher would be responsible for some of the iconic early photographs of the savage young Beatles during this time, with John even using one of Vollmer's photographs of himself leaning up against a doorway for his 1975 album of early rock covers, Rock and Roll. But it wouldn't be long until Vorman and Kircher struck up a romantic relationship, with Vorman even moving into Astra's family home, where he enjoyed his own room. The Night of Destiny occurred in 1960, when the trio had a petty argument and Klaus wandered off into the night by himself, walking into one of the most notorious and dangerous sections of the city, the Reaperbahn. In those days, the Reaper Bond was known as a haven for drunks, sailors, prostitution, drug use, and crime. Not an area that Klaus would have normally wandered alone into, but it seemed that history had other plans for the young graphic artist, and he was struck by the sound of loud music coming from one of the clubs on that fateful night. The club was called the Kaiser Keller, 
and the sound was coming from a band called Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, featuring drummer Ringo Starr. Vorman, a jazz man through and through up to that point, was taken in by the brute force and energy of the music he'd heard that night, and he was captivated by the new sound of rock and roll. This feeling was only bolstered by the next band to take the stage after the Hurricanes, their fellow Liverpool stablemates, the Beatles. Vorman said that he was left speechless by the performances and forgetting all about the argument from the previous night, the next morning Klaus urged Astrid and Jürgen to accompany him to the Reaper Bahn the next night. The trio became captivated by the music and especially the personal charm and charisma of the Beatles and they began to visit the Kaiser Keller every night at 9 p.m., taking seats just by the stage. In short order, the band themselves began to take notice of the trio, who, let's be real, stuck out like a sore thumb amongst the sailors, drunks, and pill addicts. George Harrison would say later, quote, He, Klaus, went back and told Astrid and brought her and some of their friends. There were ballet dancers with them, and they started coming in on a regular basis to see us. Astrid and Klaus would come in most frequently. They liked our band and she wanted to photograph us. John Lennon gave the trio their nickname the Exes, short for existentialists, upon seeing the obvious difference in their attire and attitude. Indeed, they would appear wearing suede coats, woolen sweaters, and jeans. But the band member who'd been captivated even more by the standout artist was a kindred spirit in the Beatles bass player, Stuart Sutcliffe. It would take a couple of days for Sutcliffe to pin the trio down, but once they were able to properly speak, the connection was clear. All four attended art college and were talented in their fields. It was a match made in heaven. Although initially the other Beatles regarded the group as somewhat of an oddity, it was clear that they had a hold over the group and were more influential than they cared to admit. George again remembered, quote, Astrid and Klaus were very influential. I remember we went to the swimming baths once and my hair was down from the water and they said, no, leave it. It's good. I didn't have my Vaseline anyway, and I was thinking, well, these people are cool. If they think it's good, I'll leave it like this. They gave me that confidence, and when it dried off, it dried naturally down, which later became the look. The mutual admiration between the Exes and the Beatles saw the trio able to divorce themselves from being German when they were with them. All three had expressed this taste and guilt about being German amidst the country's recent history, but the fact that a group of German students and British musicians could get along and feed off of one another made the group hopeful that they could find a life outside of the shadow of the Second World War. Of course, John had to get his digs in from the stage from time to time, often saying in English, you Krauts, we won the war, knowing that the German-speaking patrons had no idea what he was saying, but the English-speaking sailors in the audience would roar with laughter. But it was Sutcliffe and Kircher who would maintain the closest relationship in those early days. Sorry, Klaus. And their connection and kismet was the stuff of legend. Stewart and Astrid would become engaged in 1960, with Stewart remaining in Hamburg to pursue his art career and settle down for a life with Astrid, who called Stu the love of her life. However, we all know that tragically Stu would pass away only a couple of years later after battling intense headaches for years, culminating in a final brain hemorrhage, which took his life on 10 April 1962. He was only 21 years old. The remaining Beatles would play a huge part in helping the distraught Astrid move on from Stu's death, with John telling her one day that she had to decide if she wanted to, quote, live or die. There is no other question. Klaus ended up moving to London in the early 60s, maintaining his relationship with the Beatles and eventually moving in temporarily with George Harrison and Ringo Starr in George's Green Street flat. But it wouldn't be long until Klaus would find work as a commercial artist, considering his massive talent, and he would find a place of his own. Klaus would continue to work as a graphic artist over the next few years, but in 1963, he moved back to Hamburg temporarily to start his first band, an outfit called Patty, Klaus, and Gibson. Interestingly, Klaus would play bass right-handed despite being left-handed. The group was a technically a member of the Merseyside invasion of acts that spread all over Europe in the wake of the Beatles' success. Drummer Gibson Kemp had replaced Ringo in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and guitarist Patty Chambers had played in King Size Taylor and the Dominoes. The trio was actually the first band to be managed by Tony Stratton Smith, who would go on to manage Genesis for a time, but were eventually picked up by Brian Epstein and split time between Liverpool and Hamburg, and releasing several singles on Pi Records, one of which was produced by Paul McCartney. 
By 1966, the band started to fall apart, but Klaus would make his most iconic contribution to the story of the Beatles when John Lennon asked Klaus if he wanted to design the cover to the Beatles' next album in late 1965. Vorman dusted off his art supplies and came up with a breathtaking design that was a combination of large, exaggerated caricatures of the band coupled with scrapbook photos interspersed throughout the flowing Beatle haircuts. Haircuts, it should be noted, that Klaus had a hand in creating himself in those early days in Hamburg. Paul McCartney was a fan of the finished product, saying, quote, We knew he drew, and he'd been involved in graphic design. I must admit we didn't really know what he did, but he'd been to college. We knew he must be all right, and so we said, Why don't you come up with something for the album cover? He did, and we were all very pleased with it. We liked the way there were little things coming out of people's ears, and how he'd collage things on a small scale while the drawings were on a big scale. He also knew us well enough to capture us rather beautifully in the drawings. We were flattered. Brian Epstein reportedly cried tears of joy after seeing it. Vorman was paid the princely sum of 40 pounds for his work, but more importantly, the album cover would go on to enter the conversation amongst the all-time greats, winning the Grammy Award in 1966 for Best Album Cover Graphic Arts. This would bring demand for Klaus's work, and he would also design the Bee Gees debut album cover as well, called Bee Gees First, which featured the band above a psychedelic collage. But Klaus couldn't stay away from music, and he would actually find himself in demand as a bass player following the breakup of Patty, Klaus, and Gibson. Vorman was actually offered the low-end positions in the Hollies and the Moody Blues, but he turned down these offers to eventually join Manfred Mann in 1966 taking over for Jack Bruce, who had gone on to form Cream with Eric Clapton and Ginger Baker. Vorman's time in the group was known as the band's most successful period, with future blues band guitarist Tom McGinnis on singles like the Dylan cover Just Like a Woman and The Mighty Quinn, and going until their final single Ragamuffin Man in 1969. The band would fold into Mann's next project, a jazz fusion group known as Manfred Mann Chapter 3, but it wasn't for Klaus and he would make his exit. It was during his time with Mann, however, that he would purchase the Fender Precision Bass that he would come to use for literally the rest of his career. The bass would undergo many finish changes over the years, starting life as a sunburst, but eventually sporting some of Klaus's graphic art, and as we'd like to call it today, naturally relict these days. After his work in Manford Man, Klaus would go on to become a sought-after session musician and just listen to some of the credits that Klaus has under his belt. Initially, he would work on all four former Beatles at different times. There was even a rumor that John, George, and Ringo were going to reform with Vorman on bass with a new band called The Ladders, but in the end, this lineup only ended up playing on Ringo's 1973 song, I'm the Greatest. His first major session work was as a bass player on Jackie Lomax's 1969 album, Is This What You Want?, which was produced by George. Klaus would then go on to work on George's massive 1970 triple album, All Things Must Pass. Around the same time, Klaus was helping John on his first solo effort, 1970's Plastic Ono Band. In contrast to George's revolving door of guest musicians, Vorman was part of a very small group on Plastic Ono Band as John wanted to keep it sparse and simple, with contributions from Ringo on drums and Billy Preston on keys standing out as well. Speaking of Preston, Klaus ended up playing bass on his 1970 album, Encouraging Words, as well as appearing on Leon Russell's first album for A&M Records. In 1971, Klaus continued working with both former Beatles and acts surrounding them, playing bass on John's second album, Imagine, and also helping out on Badfinger's 1971 album, Straight Up, playing electric piano on the track Suitcase. He was a member of George's backing band at his concert for Bangladesh and played bass and guitar on Harry Nilsson's smash 1971 effort, Nilsson Schmilson. He would also appear on B.B. King's 1971 album, B.B. King in London. Klaus would continue throughout the 70s as one of the most sought-after session players in the business, eventually going on to work with acts as Peter Frampton, Carly Simon, Donovan, and Art Garfunkel. He would continue to contribute to George, John, and Ringo's solo efforts all throughout the 70s, and make sure you check out the killer video of a stripped-down version of How Do You Sleep, which features a throbbing bass line from Klaus, who looks half asleep during the session. He sure slipped into that rock star role pretty effortlessly. Vorman even tried his hand at producing, most notably for the German band Trio, which would have a worldwide hit with 1981's Da Da Da, which would be used in 1997 by German carmaker Volkswagen to viral effect. 
The song and the band who'd broken up in 1984 enjoyed a brief resurgence and would re-release some of their 80s material to capitalize on the newfound success. By 1989, Vorman had retired from the music business to spend more time with his family. But this didn't stop Vorman's artistic adventures, and he would be tapped in 1995 to design the covers to the new Beatles anthology releases. These covers are also absolutely breathtaking. You could just get lost in them. With Vorman employing the look of a wall covered in several generations of Beatle posters and advertising torn away to reveal other posters and album covers beneath. Across the three CD releases, putting them side by side gives you a look at the total picture. A long widescreen look at the Beatles' entire career. It's simply beautiful. A great idea and my favorite work from Vorman ever, even more than a Revolver cover. Klaus would dust his precision bass off to perform in 2002's Concert for George after Harrison's death from throat cancer in 2001. Vorman called George a really great guitarist and quote, the best friend I ever had. Vorman would return in 2009 with a solo album called A Side Man's Journey, which is a collection of cover songs that highlight his long and storied career. The album features a star-studded cast of characters, including Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Yusuf Islam, Bonnie Bramlett, Doris Troy, Albert Lee, Dr. John, Tom McGinnis, Van Dyke Parks, Jim Keltner, and Joe Walsh, among many others. In the last 10 years or so, Klaus has been busy continuing to work in graphic design, music, and documentary films. Even at the age of 83, Vorman hasn't slowed down. He recently even designed the cover to former Heartbreakers guitarist Mike Campbell's band The Dirty Knobs in 2020 on their album Reckless Abandon. And guess what? It's another awesome cover. Although Vorman's role in the development of the early Beatles was previously well known, I think we should really give Klaus some more love in the music department, as this video clearly proves that the guy had the chops to stand side by side with some of the biggest acts of the 1960s and 70s, and even turned down a couple of them. That's why I'm confident that you will agree with Klaus's inclusion in the series as more than worthy. But that'll be another episode of Forgotten Fretmasters, and looking back, I think this will be one of my personal favorites. Thanks for joining us yet again, and remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever we post new content. Be sure to scroll down to the description and check out some curated videos of classes playing over the years. And also remember to check out the great charitable work of the Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy Organization and help out wherever you can. And as always, thanks so much for spending a little time with us, and we will see you next time.